Good morning and welcome to Father's Day at New Hope Baptist Church. The holiday is strategically placed one month pay cycle after Mother's Day. So we are glad that you are here. And uh, any day is a good day to be in the house of the Lord with fellow believers. And uh, I ask you this morning to pray for little Audrey Wood. Um, she is at the Children's Hospital over in Dallas. Just be in prayer for her this morning if you would. Let's stand together and let's sing praises to the Father that's outpaced all of us in the Father category, a Father that we um, can all look up to and, and pattern our lives after. The 
and only because of you we are able to do that which you have called us to do. Well, because of you we are accepted and beloved. Because of you, Lord God, you have equipped us with all the spiritual blessings that we need to be the fathers, the mothers, the sons, the daughters, the brothers, the sisters, the Christians, the community members that we need to be. Lord, we trust you today. Lord, we ask you to make us, Lord, what we need to be, to help us to be conformed into your image, Lord God, so that there might be a light in this dark world. Lord God, direct us, be with this service, we pray. Lord, pour out your spirit on us today, we ask in your precious name. Good morning, you may be seated, and good morning on a beautiful Father's Day. It's good to see you. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers, and we are delighted that each and every one of you are here this morning, and it's good to see those that are visiting, and welcome to New Hope Baptist Church, and if you are visiting for the first time, I want to invite you to fill out this contact card that you will find attached to your bulletin. And we would appreciate having a record of your visit. And you can tear that card off and put it in the offering plate at the end of the service. And we are just delighted that each and every one of you are here this morning. And if there is anything that we can do to help you, please let us know. Anyone is welcome to fill out that card if you have a prayer request or a need. And put that in the offering plate. And then we will get back with you. But we trust that you are looking forward to a great service this morning and to uh, a great message from Brother Tony. If you are able to, I want to ask you to stand for our Bible reading this morning. I have a couple passages of scripture to read. The first one to be found in Genesis chapter 6. And so as you are turning there, we will dismiss Children's Church. So if you would like to go to Children's Church for children up through about third or fourth grade you may be dismissed children's church is to your right or to my left in the uh through the doorway in the back corner of the room a few feet away back there in hallway number three which is all decorated right now like a, a uh, i guess a savannah you might say for our uh, summer program that is going to be roar ROAR VBS program is going to begin this Wednesday night and will last all through the summer beginning at 645 each Wednesday night from 645 to 8 p.m. for the kids kindergarten through sixth grade. So we invite you to be here, check in time at 630 and then 645 to 8 o'clock for the ROAR VBS program each Wednesday night all summer long. Our Bible reading this morning, Genesis chapter 6. Verses number 5 through 8, the Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then I'd like to read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 7, where the Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that we have today. We pray that you would guide and direct the message this morning that you have given to Brother Tony and that you would help him to say just exactly what <coughs> each one of us need this morning, that our hearts would be uh, challenged or encouraged, convicted, or whatever we need this morning, uh, the comfort and edification from, from your word, that we would be drawn closer to you that we would take another step forward for you in our Christian life. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us in this, in this life, for your love. We pray that you would help us to be faithful to you, that we would be mindful of your presence in our life through each and every moment. We pray that you would 
be with the programs that are taking place right now in other places, in the nurseries, in the, in the children's church, in this room, that all of it would honor and glorify you and speak to hearts. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Miss Tanya, wait a minute. The, uh, uh, when I was young, I used to believe that there was an animal that existed that, uh, that uh, was part alligator, part some other real creepy monster, and I won't go into detail about how to describe it. Um, and uh, that was called a wampus gator. Now, the reason that I believed it was because there was a group of men from our church, including my dad, that carried a group of us guys out camping one day. And, um, and one of them went out next to, uh, next to the dam out in the dark and uh, to use the bathroom and he uh, started banging on the water with a stick and screaming. And the other guys who were all in on it, all the men, um, began to explain what had happened to him. That wampus gator that guy. And one at a time, the men in our group began to disappear until it was just us boys left. And it was a traumatic experience, and I still sleep with a nightlight. And uh, that's not the business, and that's not true. But anyway, the point is, I believed for some part of my life what I was told by the men in my life. And one of the things that, that we're talking about this morning is the importance of that male influence. And, and how that especially in the formal, formable times of our lives, how important it is to, to, to have what you believe and what is important fostered in a godly way. And so even while um, all of us in here have experienced God's plan imperfectly, it's still God's plan. This morning Rachel told me that it was our turn to sing and we hadn't prepared it in a long week. Um, and we haven't done this song in a long time, but I just want you to, as we're singing the song, remember, um, especially as, as men, that your influence on somebody else, you're the best Christian that some little eyes have ever seen. And that, that some little eyes know. Still care. What a 
born on Father's Day. Uh, it is an honor. Uh, no greater job uh, in the world for a man than to be a husband and father and a uh, greater responsibility. And our ushers, for the mic they are ready, um, our ushers are, used, are gonna hand out um, a little gift today to the fathers. And this gift is not one that's gonna get you in trouble. <laughs> Last time we handed out a little pocket-sized uh, um, credit card size knives that fold up like the size of a credit card and you put it in your wallet and we had a couple people get stopped at airports <laughs> so we're not going to do that to you this time um, this is something that uh, that uh, we would love for you to use and remember what Deuteronomy chapter number 6 says about keeping uh, and raise your hand if you are a father if, uh, uh, if you are a male you have children and uh, we want to give you those these are um little bookmarks that go in your Bible um, that I uh, want you to remember the, the uh, command in Deuteronomy to, uh, to uh, keep God's Word in front of your eyes and to, uh, to uh, keep it in front of your children's eyes and the responsibility that God has given us to do that. And so just a little something to uh, remember uh, our responsibility and the privilege it is to be a, a father. And in, in um, Hebrews, if you would, we're going to be in Hebrews, we're going to stay in Hebrews, chapter number 11, and verse number 7, keep your hands up, um, until you, uh, until you get that, if you get passed up, keep your hands up, and look like you're going to land an airplane. Um, and again, thank you for being here today, I always like to, uh, to give us an idea of what's going on in the world, in our lives the importance of what we're doing. I want to read a couple of statistics, but I want to wait until they get done handing these out because these are important. And I understand I'm not going to read all of them because I understand when you start, start reading numbers that people start kind of checking out. And so, but I do want you to get these numbers. Um, but before I do again, I want to read Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 7. We're also going to have communion together for a very special reason this morning. One reason is it's our month to have communion. Um, the other reason we'll get to here in a minute why we're doing it this week. Um, I had uh, a couple of you say, but don't you know it's Father's Day when we're doing communion? Uh, yes. I have calendar as well. So thank you though for helping me because you know me well enough to know that I will double plan stuff without paying attention. Uh, but here I want you to read what with me in Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not as of yet not seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Why don't you get the responsibility here that Noah had? What was Noah doing? Of all the generations that were on the earth at the time, what was Noah's responsibility? Noah's responsibility was to build an ark for the saving of his house. Noah was not trying to save the world. Noah was building an ark. I mean, you've been to the ark experience in, where is that, Kentucky or whatever? Anybody in here been to that? I know a couple of you have. Um, that thing's huge. I was talking to Sam Satellite, and he was telling me that they hauled the middle beam of that ark. So where is it, Kentucky? Kentucky. They, they were, he was the only person in the United States who had a beam big enough to meet the specs for that ark. Sam Satellite, his coming. And um, so it was his responsibility to trek it from wherever it was uh, on the other side of the United States. And he said, he was telling me what a huge thing it was for him to get that one piece of wood to Kentucky to build that ark. Noah was, a, him and his sons, a hundred years. Now, I don't know how long your last project took, guys. <laughs> but this is a project. Okay, a hundred years. Took Sam Satterwhite weeks to get this one piece of lumber for that ark encounter in Kentucky. And no one working with gas powered machinery, you know, this guy is hewing out stuff by hand. It's a huge thing. Google it. Um, anyway, uh, Noah built this thing. Why? Not to save the world. Not this huge, he's saving his house. We're going to talk about this morning as Brother Scott goes to my office and gives my clicker. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Christian and, and, and 
fatherly family leadership. As we do that, I want you to listen to these statistics. I was asking a couple of guys in here this morning, I said, um, I actually used the example of lottery. Forget that example, not a very good example because you're going to put the moral aspect in it. Um, uh, but if I told you I had a, a business plan for you and you had a 50 50 chance of it succeeding, would you do it? Probably not. You might, might not. But hey, at least it's a 50 50 chance. What if I told you that you had a 75% chance of this business venture succeeding? Would you invest with me? That's a pretty good chance. Hey, 75%? What if I told you you had a 90 plus percent chance of it succeeding? I mean, I wouldn't have a problem. I guarantee 95% chance of it succeeding. 90 plus percent chance of it succeeding. I want you to listen to these statistics. You can find them in several different places. But according to Lifeway Research Group, Father's Day is, uh, is, is the holiday with the single lowest average church attendance. Okay, that's worth it. Single lowest average church attendance of the year. Thank you for being here this morning. And uh, I love the fact that New Hope is, is, is breaks several different statistical uh, anomalies. But, um, but in, on average, in the United States, Father's Day, lowest average church attendance of the year. Even lower than Labor Day, Memorial Day, and Fourth of July weekends. It's interesting, especially since Mother's Day is the highest attended church service only after Easter and Christmas. It goes Easter, Christmas, Mother's Day. Now, we can talk about why. One of the reasons, if you, if you do any, any study in it, is that mothers are interested in their children's spiritual well-being. Just at New Old Baptist Church, I heard several mothers who had told their children, when they said, what do you want for Mother's Day? Those mothers said, I want you to be in church with me. That was what they wanted for Mother's Day. Okay, that's why Mother's Day is the third highest attended church service of the year. Father's Day, however, lowest attended, not behind anything. Okay? Now, that being said, listen to these statistics. As we're talking about Father's leadership and responsibility. According to data collected by Promise Keepers and Baptist Press, if a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, only one child in 50, one in 50 will become a regular worshiper. If a father does go regularly, um, does go regularly, regardless of whether or not the mother goes or not, between two-thirds and three-quarters of children will attend regularly. Pause for emphasis. If a mother attend, attends regularly without the father, one in 50 children will attend regularly. If dad will go, one in three or one in, or uh, no, uh, two in three or three in four We'll go regularly. Dad, look, all you got to do, all you got to do is show up. This is one of the easiest tasks that you will ever do. All you have to do, show up regularly. You don't have to, you don't have to put on a show. You don't have to sing in the choir. You don't have to, you, all you got to do for your kids to go to church regularly is go. That's a guaranteed win right there. That is well above 50% added. Just doing the math. What do you want for your kids? But it gets better. But wait. Another study focuses just on Sunday school. They found similar results. If both parents attend Sunday, Sunday school services or Bible study, 72% 72, 72 of children will do so when they're grown. When only the father attends, 55% of their children will do the same. When only the mother, 15%. When neither, 6%. By the way, if, by the way, you find yourself today in a 
less than the ideal place. That's fine. Be the 13%. That's fine, Mom. Listen, if you hear by yourself today, don't be discouraged. Just be the 13%. That's what I love about Christians. Understand that Christians, all through Scripture, are the remnant. Or what is referred to in Scripture as the remnant. It doesn't matter if, if you're not in an ideal situation, if, you, if, if you've gone through situations in your life that are less than ideal and, 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 and don't line up with God's perfect plan. I love what the Bible says. Proving what he is. And this is why, by the way, Christians don't ask the question, well, what's wrong with blah, blah, blah? I'm like, what? No, Christians say, proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're not trying to find out what we can get away with. We're trying to find out what is good and acceptable and perfect. Sometimes I look at my, my life and I say, hmm, guess what? I missed the perfect will. I missed that thing by a mile. I'm going to have to accept, I'm going to have to settle for the acceptable will. I'm going to have to recalculate. I didn't do so good. So here's where I am. And, and, and as believers, what we want to do is we want to be, we want to be that, that person who, who is consistently faithful, who trusts God for the results. If mom, you're here regularly, you want to be that 13%. You want to do whatever you got to do to fight the odds. However, dad, if all you've got to do is show up for the love of mercy, can't you just say, okay, I'll see you next week? My wife told me yesterday my grass would be there next week. My wife said, hey, let's create a grandbaby pool. I said, Rachel, I ain't got time to go to the pool. Why? You got to cut the grass. She said, cut the grass? Yeah. It'll be there when we get back. I said, yeah, but it'll be this much taller. I can live with that. Fine. So here we go. Beautiful. We smooshed it in somehow. And the grass got cut. But, listen guys, be the anomaly. Be the difference you want to make. Guys, show up. Listen to this. How many of you would agree that the number one thing in your child's life, men and women, I want to know, how many of you agree, the number one thing in your child's life is that they come to know Christ their personal Lord and Savior? Well, I don't think there's any doubt. Why? Here's why. Because you're going to be dead longer than you're going to be alive. You know why I had so much to do this week? Because I had two funerals this week. Pray for those families who've lost loved ones, who are losing loved ones. That's us, by the way. Listen to this. This is incredible. Another survey found if, that if a child is the first person in the household to become a Christian, there's a 3.5% probability everyone else in the household will follow. If the mother is the first person to become a Christian, then there's a 17% probability that everyone in the household will follow. However, when the father is the first, there is a 93% probability that the rest of the family will follow. When the father is the first person to accept Christ and to begin his Christian journey, there's a 93% chance that everybody else in that household will say, okay, me too. Listen, guys, there's a reason your wife is not indecisive. Let's start right there. Today after church, y'all are going to have this long, drawn-out conversation about where to go eat. And it is not because your wife is indecisive. You think your wife's so dumb she don't know where she wants to go eat? <laughs> that is not true. She wants you to be involved. <coughs> she won't. That's not true. She don't care. Really? I think she does. Negative. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> What she does want for you to get your man pants on and be involved in the conversation. <laughs> That's what's really going on. She wants you to be involved and engaged in the conversation. She wants you to be the guy that says, hey, we're going to eat. She wants you to be the guy. To be that guy that, that, that she feels like she can lean on, that she can follow. That is, by the way, how God designed it to work. Let's look at a couple things about building this ark for our house 
for our home. See, guys like a, an objective. They like a goal. And here's the goal for us. This goal is to build an ark for the saving our, of our house. And we have to hurry. Number one, we need the right reason. What is the right reason? A couple things. Number one, or A, Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 7, Noah being warned of God. Listen, we know what the objective is and we know why. God has told us what this life is. God has told us what this world is like. God has told us the, the beginning. God has told us how that we are in a fallen world because of sin. God has told us the end. That he that believes not is condemned already. We have the warning. Guys, act on the warning that we've been given. Men, take the lead. Men, act towards your children like it is important. They'll believe it. Around here we call it the versa railing effect. You know why we had that little, why we bought that dumb plastic thing that says welcome you about the church? We believe if we tell you you're welcome, you'll believe it. That's why they do that at the bank. That versa railing is that little bitty piece of cloth that makes like three, three rows. You ever seen that? You go in the bank, it has three rows. It says enter here. And there, and there could be three tellers, nobody in there but you. And you'll go in there and you'll walk to that thing. <laughs> and you're just looking out there looking at you. You have no idea why you're walking through the first rail. You're just doing it because it said enter here. They said, they suggested that that was the appropriate way from this point to there. And you walk three rows to get there. And they have to talk when you're gone like, did you see that? <laughs> Can you believe? Well, yeah, you said. Go, that's what I did. And listen, fathers, if you'll tell your children it's important, they'll believe it. They'll believe there is a wumpus skater out there and it's going to get them. All you got to do is just tell them it's important. There was a warning. Act on it. Faith is the second reason. Do you believe it? <clears throat> the reason we don't act on it, we don't really believe it ourselves. We have to believe it. The Bible says by faith, Noah, be warned. Of what? Things as of yet not seen. Do you believe there's something bigger than this? That is of yet not seen? Something more important than your money, than your stuff, than your activities? That's faith. Your children need to see us acting on faith in what God has said is important. What God has said is appropriate. What God has said is right. Not just that, fear. The Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Believe God's bigger than you? What our children do not need to see is that they do not need to see our fathers being the toughest people in the world. They need to see fathers bowing, bowing the knee to the toughest person in the world. That God is bigger than me. That God is tougher than me. That God is all powerful. Because what happens then when you go from seeing the toughest person that you've ever known? Because here's what happens. When we act appropriate, inappropriately and we act outside of God's objective truth, then our children end up seeing how that the world doesn't work. And why do people get so, so uh, uh, discouraged with life? Because what they thought was true as a child... They grow up as a, as a young person and as a teenager and as an adult to realize none of it's true. When I was in the youth department, here's my number one problem. The kids were like, listen, my friends, none of my friends agree. My parents don't agree. The adults in my life don't agree. I just make up my own life. I do what I want to do. Nobody in my life knows what's going on. Nobody in my life can agree on what's right, on what's true. Everything I thought was true and real and right Every time I turn around, all of a sudden it's wrong. <coughs> Somebody's got to submit to what God has to say. Notice the Bible says in verse number 7, He was moved with fear. You move with fear, you'll do something crazy like build a boat for 100 years. 
build a boat big enough to, to save an entire family, to save an entire population, you'll, 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 you'll follow the directions. Number one, the right reason. Second, the right route. The right route was what? By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things of yet, as of yet not seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. His right route was the obedience <coughs> to what God had said do. We all have a plan, don't we? Was well, guys, we like to have a plan. We like to know what we're going to do. This is how it's going to be. This is what's going. This is what's going to be like. This is what we're going to do. Our plan needs to be follow God's plan. Our plan needs to be. There's already a plan. God has a way. God has a plan. God gave uh, Noah exact directions on how to do what needed to be done. And you know why? God blessed. If you read in Genesis chapter number six. Just the first part of Genesis chapter number 7, that Noah was found righteous in obeying God's commands. That's the route right. That's the route right. The right route. Got my name told me. That's the right route. That's how we, how we succeed as a father as opposed to, listen, nothing wrong. In fact, I think a very healthy thing for our children to hear, I was wrong. That's why one of the greatest verses in Scripture, let God be true and let every man be a liar. We're wrong. Let's just say God's right and I'm wrong. That's the right route. And then lastly, the right resolve. The right resolve. Listen, I'm going to do it just because I said I'm going to do it. Remember those days? Yeah. I'm going to do it. I said I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be good at what I said I was going to do. <clears throat> Listen to what happened with Noah. Verse number 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God as uh, things as of yet not seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world. See what happened? Why? Because of this person's faithfulness. You can see the contrast between what he was doing between what everybody else in the world is doing. Can you imagine the conversation Noah must have had? No, what are you doing? I'm building a boat. Why? And why are you building here? That's a big boat. And finally, after years, Noah, are you still building that boat? Yeah. I'm still building the boat, man. You're never going to get that boat done. You're never going to finish. Okay. He gets up day after day after day. Why so big? All the questions. There's going to be a flood. There ain't going to be a flood, man. If it ain't flooded by now, it ain't going to flood. That consistency of a father. He gets saved. He shows up. He lives the example. He doesn't give up. And finally, a kid just says, hey, man, this is probably important. He just keeps on doing it. I love what the book of Psalms says. In the book of Psalms, chapter number 62, verse number um, 6, the Bible says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. This attitude of a godly father who understands the right route, and the right reason and has the right resolve. <coughs> this is what God has told me to do. This person doesn't go to Sunday school because he likes a Sunday school class. He goes to Sunday school because right to go to Sunday school. He didn't go to church because right because because he enjoys the church service or enjoys the music. He doesn't go to church because he likes the people there. He doesn't read his Bible because he necessarily gets some out of it every time. He does what he does because it's right to do. And he doesn't care if it hair lips from Maharaja at Jephthah. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm following the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He doesn't love his wife because his wife is the prettiest girl that he's ever seen. I ask people sometimes during marriage counseling, I say, you think I can find anybody better than Rachel? No. What? Nobody exists better than her. Like I was the guy who found the best person in the world that I'm getting that little. 
So turn it around. Think Rachel can find anybody better than me? Yeah, now we have consensus. <laughs> right? Of course she could. Let me an ignoramus just because you know the situation, because you know us. Yes, she could find a better deal. The right husband doesn't stay married because he found the best deal. Because he feels like flowers and songs every day. He does it because it's right. I don't feel very loving today. Well, you better get on it. Because the Bible commands you to love your wife. If I don't feel loving, nobody cares. <laughs> Go learn how. Right? As the Bible said, Jesus told him, said, Go learn what this means. <laughs> right? Jesus told us, You need to learn what that means, bro. I don't feel like, okay. So? You're not going to always feel today like you feel tomorrow. It's going to change up and down, back and forth. We don't jump out of situations because we feel something. We do what we do because God commanded it. And because it's important. Because people are looking. And you're the best Christian somebody knows. And then, you end up with the right result. That's <coughs> so what the Bible says. We'll close with this. The Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of things, yet not seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by the which he, was con uh, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So I read you the verse as, uh, as uh, I'll tell you what, <coughs> Um, Rachel, if you would come to the piano. And if I could get some guys to come. I mean, we need you, Brother Scott. Let me get some guys to come for the communion. I read you these statistics about fathers and how effective they can be, but let me read you this. Today, 24 million children live separate from their fathers. Less than half of professing Christians regularly attend church. Less than half of, re of professing Christians, less than half of professing Christian fathers, rather, regularly attend church. More mothers than fathers regularly attend church. But less than half of professing Christian fathers regularly attend church. And don't think for one second that you're not teaching a lesson. The lesson's being taught. And so here's what Jesus said. Here's what God did. As God left the land of Egypt, they put blood on the doorpost of their house, showing that one day Jesus would pay this great price. I want to read this verse real quick, too. That's what the Bible says. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed on me, was not in vain. So it's God's grace that, that, that we. That he makes us and gives us the opportunity to be the Father. But listen to what he says. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not all, <coughs> but the grace of God that was with me. It's just because I had the grace of God doesn't mean that I didn't put the work in. So God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to paint this blood on the doorpost of your house. as this idea that I am the, 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 the deliverance for you. The payment for you. And then I want you to begin to observe this Passover together. <clears throat> and they carried that on through history. And the early church began to, to observe that together as well. We do it on um, this month and several months are here, but this, this month in particular. And Jesus, as he sat with his disciples, we often call this together communion, a communion of believers. You today are a believer and you don't have sin in your life that you've just decided you're going to let it stay there. I guess I know I'm sinning and I don't really care. Well, this is not for you. If you're like, hey, I'm a part of, of this body of Christ that's moving forward. I'm a part of, 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 of this kingdom of God that is moving forward. Listen, you're in communion together. There's this communion. What does that even mean? It means that Jesus sits down with his disciples and the church sits down together and they're in communion. They're in agreement. 
that God's, the things of God, the kingdom of God, the things of God, the plans of God, the directions of God are important things. When you partake in communion, in the body and blood of Christ, what you're saying is, I understand when I accept Jesus Christ, my personal Savior, I accepted His, His blood for my salvation, His body that represent, it was represented the life that I ought to be living in Him, the example that He set forth in His, in His literal existence here on this earth. And I'm in communion with that. I'm in agreement with that. That's what communion is. That's why the Bible says, don't eat or drink unworthily of this because that's damnable stuff right there. That's you making light of what Jesus did. You say, guys, you in communion with what's going on here? Men, women, you in communion with this idea that God has come up with the family? Or are you just like, hey, it's not a big deal. Do you know what's a big deal? Just look around. You got kids who looked at mom and dad and thought, oh man, this is awesome. This is wonderful. And then Tony Pierce let them down. And like, I thought it was going to be way better than that. And I had to tell them, hey, you know what? I, I was wrong. I messed that up. But God's plan is still right. So we can be, he can be trusted. So today we partake in communion. God, I have to say, forgive me because I was wrong. Sometimes I do that to my wife. Especially in our early years where I would, I would fire back and I would be critical or rude or, 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 or say things that I shouldn't say. And my children would sit and I'd say, hey, I'm wrong. I thought that's not, I didn't line up with God's standard. So guys, listen, I'm in communion with Him and His standard. I have to get back in line with that. So today, if you're in communion with Him, we ask you to be a part of this today. If you're not, we ask you, listen, to get in line with Him and His purpose, His plan. Not just for family, for life. And if it hadn't gone the way you thought it was going to go when you were looking up at your parents as a, as, as a child, that's okay. If you made bad decisions and it didn't work out like you thought it was going to work out, listen, that's okay. The redemption and grace of God is bigger than that. That's right. But let's don't say, let's don't use the old nobody's perfect thing as a reason to stay in the rut of disobedience. A rut is just a grave with the ends knocked out. Don't stay there. Say, Lord, I want to be in communion with you and your plan. So today, we're going to partake in this communion of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians tells us, I'm going to use one of my paid points. Paul says, I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The same night the Lord, as they were partaking of what they would have referred to at the time as the Passover, he said, he said um, um, that, uh, that, that, that Paul was, was, was telling the story, was relaying what had happened. He said, Jesus gave thanks and he said, take eat. This is my body. My body is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. He first of all talks about his body and how that he came. And remember what Jesus said, how that the, the husband is supposed to love their wife as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Christ said, I didn't, come to, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. The Bible says He loved the church. He gave Himself for it. And there is just something in that sacrificial kind of love. How many times I've been talking to, to wives and they've said something like, well, I just, that's the kind of relationship as I begin to explain to them. God's plan for relationship. Man, that's the kind of relationship I want. Guys, you know how I many how many women in here, how many women in this world would love to have a man who would just love them the way the Bible says love? Be in communion with God's plan? They would be all over that. And even if it didn't work out at first, you got to be strong enough to be the guy who takes the steps first. Well, I don't like it, Well, We're going to have to learn to like it. 
Because this is what God's called us to do. Be in communion with His life here on earth. As these guys come, let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for Your love and mercy. We thank You for Your body broken for us as an example of a life lived for others. In your precious Son, Jesus Christ. church this many times and I read my Bible this many times, I do hope that you're not trying to be saved that way. In your incompleteness. The Bible says all have sinned they, and they've done what? Come short of the perfect glory of God. Here's why you can be saved. God did not come short in any way. Jesus Christ and His body on this earth 
Bible says he was tempted in all, all manner, like as you and I, but did not fail in any of those. What he does is he applies salvation to you when you come to him humbly for that salvation. You don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. That is the amazing grace of God and it's seen in His body. We have an example. And what we're doing today is an example. An example of our communion with Him. Now, Lord, I can't live up to what You've done. <clears throat> but with Your help, I'll do it better tomorrow. I'll do it better tomorrow. I'll be a better husband tomorrow. I'll be a better father tomorrow. I've really messed some things up yesterday. Tomorrow, I'll be better. Because why? Because we're in communion with Him. He took the bread and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do you as often as you do in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your body, broken for us. Thank you, Lord God, for coming in incarnate form to this earth to purchase salvation for us in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name.
says the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, the vile as he, wash all my sins away. Jesus was on the cross. The dying thief said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. See, it wasn't enough. See, another person coming to the earth couldn't have made it happen by just doing good either. It wasn't the one who just happened to live perfect and so could die for your sin. If you want to know, if you want to know who somebody is, check their blood. And that's why the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You see it even in the picture of the Old Testament when they would sacrifice the lamb without spot or blemish and they would bring it in to the Holy of Holies. And they would apply it to the mercy seat wherein resided the presence of God. You see that when Jesus Christ dies. We now have that holiest of all blood. And that's why Hebrews says that that is over. All of that sacrifice is over because if that could have done it, we'd still be doing it today. Now that one perfect lamb without spot or blemish was sacrificed for you and I. And the reason a believer is a believer, the reason a believer is always a believer, the reason a child of God is always a child of God is because of their blood. I have some children that we haven't always had the best fellowship. They're always my children. They can change their name to whatever they want to change it to. Check their blood. Take some of my blood, take some of their blood, see whose kid they are. Love the fact that God has applied His precious shed blood to my sinful life. Let us reason together, said the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. How does he do it? By applying his blood to your filthy sin through his grace. After he had taken the bread, he took the cup and said, Take drink, this is my blood. It was shed for you. It was shed for you. Just do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you cared enough about us to shed your perfect blood on the cross for us. Lord oh God, help us to be in complete communion with you. Lord, in every area of our lives, help us to be an example of the believer. Lord, we love you and thank you for the sacrifice you made for us. Help us to live a life sacrificially for others. In your precious name. Thank you so much for being here today with Scott. If you would come, make an outage.